welcome everybody to the dog symposium today and we're going to talk about thyroid function in animals and how thyroid function affects behavior and we're going to do that in two parts we'll finish the first part we'll have a short stretch break and then we'll start the second part and then we're going to have a question and answer session um, that Joseph will hopefully um, organize for all of us good I don't know what happened there uh oh I'm too big what happened uh, <laughs> uh oh there Okay, um, with one of the greyhounds we have at Hemopet, and we rescue these from the race tracks outside of California, because California does not allow greyhound racing. So these animals, after their racing career, or if they don't race well enough, will often be killed. So we rescue them when they become part of Hemopet, and we have 200 greyhounds, give or take a few, in our facility in Southern California. And every three weeks, we get a new batch of greyhounds from the state of Arizona, the state of Texas, and the state of Oklahoma. We then adopt out every week as family pets six or seven or eight greyhounds depending on who's available and we're very very strict about the people that can adopt them tonight we're going to talk it's tonight for me it's not for you we're going to start at the beginning by talking about thyroid function just so you know i've been a veterinarian for 54 years I laugh about it because I tell people it was really my late mother that was the student that long ago, not me, because I'm obviously not that old. But in fact, I really am that old and I've been a better name, as I said, for 54 years. At the time when I became a veterinarian, lady veterinarians were not popular and um, it was very difficult for us as ladies to get into veterinary school. And that's quite different today, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, but anyway, being stubborn and being determined, and, and I was going to be a veterinarian, I was able to get high enough grades and work on a farm for two summers because I had never worked with farm animals in order to be a veterinarian. But let's not talk about me, let's talk about the thyroid, and let's talk about the problem in pet animals with thyroid disease, which is the most common hormonal disease of dogs and cats. Actually, in cats, diabetes is also common, but certainly in dogs, thyroid dysfunction is the most common endocrine hormone problem. The difficulty is that with line breeding and inbreeding of very popular breeds and popular families of dogs, the incidence of thyroid function can become very high. And when that occurs, nobody wants to admit it. And so there's a big denial problem about that. And we laugh and we say that denial is not just what it sounds like, and it isn't a river in Egypt, the Nile River. It's a joke on the name Nile, the Nile, as in the Nile River. So here you see a picture of a, of a client of ours with her Irish setter. And the Irish setter is digging the hole down to Taiwan. He's decided that he's gonna keep digging until he ends up on the other side of the earth in China and of course Taiwan. But we say, don't bury your heads in the ground. We have to admit that inherited problems occur, and we don't want to continue to breed those animals that pass those heritable problems on to their babies. So what breeds, for example, in most of the world are at high risk for thyroid disease? The first is a very popular golden retriever. 
Now these dogs are obviously very healthy, but I'm showing you the slide just to show you the golden retrievers have a lot of medical problems that are heritable today because they're so popular. Um, many of you may know that they have a high risk for a cancer of the liver and spleen as well called hemangiosarcoma. And they have hip dysplasia and a variety of other genetic defects. A cardiac, a heart defect um, is quite common in the breed as well. So here's another popular breed in much of the world. This is a high risk for thyroid disease and that's the Shetland. And so in countries like Taiwan, for example, smaller breeds may be more popular, especially in the cities, just like they are in North America and Europe. And so breeds like the Sheltie have become very popular and they have a lot of thyroid disease as well. And we're talking about inherited thyroid disease now that is passed on from one or both parents to the puppies. Here's another breed that you may recognize, the Maltese, the Maltese Terrier. And this little Maltese is quite uh, popular throughout the world. And many breeds and crossbreeds like Maltese with Poodle are popular pets. And they have a lot of thyroid disease too of an inherited nature. This little dog's name is Olivia. Okay, but the important thing for us to realize is that all animals are not the same. It's very difficult for us as veterinarians uh, to diagnose thyroid problems in animals when the laboratory results that we get have a reference range for the species, the dog, for example, and it's a very broad reference range that involves all dogs of adult age of all breed types, from the toy chihuahua to the St. Bernard. Now, obviously, that doesn't make any sense. The metabolism, the activity, and the appetite of little dogs is much more active. They are more active metabolically than large breed dogs, and they also live longer. So their home thyroid function in health cannot be the same as that of the Newfoundland or Great Dane or Labrador Retriever or St. Bernard just as examples. Also, because puppies are growing, they need a more active metabolic uh, rate than adult dogs. And so therefore their basal, the resting thyroid levels of healthy puppies should be higher than those of adults. And so the laboratory reference range does not take that into account. And so a puppy could have a thyroid level on several tests that are in the lower end of the adult reference range and could be misdiagnosed as being normal when in fact they're not normal, they're abnormal for a puppy. <coughs> Excuse me. Now geriatric animals are not growing anymore and their metabolic needs are less and so they tend to be less active and so they can have lower basic basal thyroid levels than adult dogs have for the same breed or breed type so therefore the reference ranges for older animals are not correct either large and giant breeds as i've mentioned here normally would have a lower basal thyroid level when they're normal than other typical breeds of mid-size. And then the interesting thing is sighthounds have much lower basic basal thyroid levels than other breed types. And this applies to all the sighthounds, including breeds like greyhounds that we have, um, Afghan hounds, for example, um, Irish wolfhounds are a sighthound, Salukis, Thai Ridgebacks, um, there's all kinds of animals that are sighthounds that are classified as sighthounds that should have lower thyroid levels than the other breed types. And in fact, many people don't know what breeds are in the sighthound class. For example, the Basenji from Africa is also a sighthound, and many people don't know that. And they expect the Senjis to have higher thyroid levels than they should have. So all dogs are not the same. And as shown here in this cute photograph, you have the Basset Hound, 
You have here, which is probably a Welsh Springer Spaniel, a sporting dog, and the Great Dane. And they're totally different sizes, but they have also different purposes in life. This sporting dog, you would expect to be very active when it's out in the field. The basset hound sort of looks at you with sad eyes and long ears and clumps along, you know. So it's obviously going to be a hound, and it's not going to be running or active like this retriever. Well, let's take another step back and look at how thyroid disease is impacted by our immune system. And by the way, all the things I'm talking to you generally tonight about apply to ourselves as human beings and to other mammals. And so the basic mechanisms of what we're talking about tonight apply to human beings as well. So please keep them in mind when you look and study about what we're talking about. Now, autoimmune thyroiditis is an inflammation of the thyroid gland caused by active immune lymphocytes that get into the thyroid gland and destroy it. And I'll show you some pictures later um, on, on part two. Now, thyroiditis in animals is the same as human Hashimoto's disease, which, of course, was first recognized in the Orient in Japan. So it's an attack of the thyroid gland, genetically inherited and targeted by lymphocyte white blood cells that are programmed genetically to destroy the thyroid gland progressively over a period of, in the dog, one to two years, and in ourselves, 20 years. And eventually, when the thyroid gland is damaged sufficiently, hypothyroidism will occur, hypo meaning low. So it will lead to no function of the thyroid gland because much of the thyroid gland has been destroyed by this autoimmune process, and so it can't function normally. And as I said earlier, it's the most common hormonal disease of dogs. Now, the opposite problem, hyperthyroidism, which is more active thyroid hormone, is quite uncommon in the dog. Uncommon unless the dog has a thyroid tumor or cancer, which is rare, or they've been overdosed with thyroid therapy um, inappropriately. So in the dog, we don't see overactive thyroid hormone very commonly. In the cat, however, especially older cats, that are 6, 8, or 10 years, or even 16 years of age, this becomes the most common um, hormonal disease of older cats, with diabetes being the most common hormonal disease of cats of all ages. Now, in cats, soy and too much iodine in the food are known to promote hyperthyroid activity. And this is very similar in some older cats to what is known in humans as Graves' disease. <coughs> Excuse me. Autoimmune hyperthyroidism in people. So hypothyroidism in people of an immune nature, thyroiditis is Hashimoto's disease, hyperthyroidism of an immune na nature in people is Graves' disease. Now the clinical signs and the behavioral changes that occur in thyroid disease mimic those of many other diseases. And so it's difficult for the pet owner and the veterinarian often to recognize these problems because they're treating skin disease or weight gain or hair loss or sudden behavioral changes as being that problem when the underlying problem is a thyroid imbalance. In the early inflammatory stages of thyroid disease, you see behavioral issues, and it can be submissiveness, where the animal, when you come up to it, rolls over and pees on itself, or urinates on itself. Or it can be aggressive, suddenly, out of the blue, unprovoked. Or it can be phobic, where the animal suddenly becomes terrified of noises like firecrackers or thunderstorms or certain objects that flap in front of them. So they have phobias that they never had before. Subtle gain in weight. And the veterinarian seeing the animal says, oh, no, uh, um, Mrs. Um, Choi, uh, Mrs. Choi, you've been feeding your dog too much. Or Mrs. Choi says, no, no, doctor, I have not been feeding my pet too much. There's a weight gain here caused by something else. And then you have recurring infections. 
The animals have infected ears. They have infections between their toes. Um, they're licking their feet all the time. They can have skin infections. They can have chronic um, infected teeth and gums. Uh, they can have anal gland infections. They have a variety of common infections. And often because their immune system is disrupted, they are filled with yeast and they smell like yeast. And yeast, as you probably know, smells like rancid butter, smoiled butter, or even beer. And so when the animal smells of yeast, it means that there's a chemical imbalance on the surface of the body caused by some underlying problem. In cats that have hyperthyroidism, overactive thyroids, they can have kidney disease, liver disease, and gastrointestinal bowel disease at the same time. Okay, so let's look at the top 10 clarifications of this whole disease state that we're talking about. Classical clinical signs of hypothyroidism with low thyroid values in the blood, which is what the, the typical clinical veterinarian is looking for to make a suspected and then a proven diagnosis, do not occur until equal or more than 70% of the thyroid gland is destroyed. So nearly two, more than two thirds of the thyroid gland has to be damaged and inactivated before you get the classical clinical signs of the thyroid values. Well, goodness me, if we wait until that happens, it's too late. We need to diagnose it early. So as I said in the previous slide, clinical and behavioral changes, especially aggression, can occur in the early stage of this disease before 70% or more of the thyroid gland is destroyed. And unlike the liver or the bowel or the bone marrow, the thyroid gland tissue, once it's destroyed, cannot regenerate. So when the liver's damaged, if you can solve the reason, the liver can regenerate and help heal itself. The thyroid gland cannot do that. Once the tissue's gone, it's gone. What do we mostly test for when veterinary thyroid function on a routine health panel? Whoops, sorry. Uh, whoops, whoops, whoops. I'm trying to go backwards. Let me see if I can do that now. There we go, um, is we just measure the total T4. So veterinarians are told all you have to do is measure the blood counts, the liver, kidney enzyme levels, the electrolytes, and the total T4 to be able to determine if thyroid gland dysfunction has anything to do with the problem. That is totally wrong because any other illness, non-thyroidal, or the use of certain drugs like sulfonamides or phenobarbital, for example, or steroids, will suppress this level in the blood, even though the animal may not be hypothyroid. So it gives you an overdiagnosis of hypothyroidism when something else is causing it. In cats, it underdiagnoses hyperthyroidism because some other disease will make it look lower within the normal range. So you miss hypothyroidism in dogs, or you overdiagnose it, and you miss hyperthyroidism in cats. Or if thyroid uh, function metabolism or, or medication, I should say, is overdosed, it can look lower if something else is going on. So you cannot use T4 alone to accurately measure the amount of thyroid hormone therapy a pet needs. And it doesn't measure the autoantibodies damaging the thyroid gland, so you don't make a diagnosis of that form of thyroid disease at all. Aha. So what do you have to do? And I teach this, I've been teaching this for decades, and it's very hard for veterinarians clinically to grasp this because that's not what they're taught typically in veterinary school, and it's often not the, what they're taught in con continuing education in graduate school afterwards. So let's just do a total T4, and maybe the free T4. Gosh, what's that? The free T4 does not mean free, no charge. It's the unbound tiny fraction of the total. 0.1% of the total T4 is free and unbound. Why is that important? 
there's a free T4 is a biologically active form of the hormone that tells the body what to do. The total T4 is just the reserve. So then you can say, oh, I know in humans we measure thyroid stimulating hormone, which is TSH. So maybe we should just measure that in the dog. And maybe we can just use human reagents that are readily available to measure TSH in the dog. Cannot do that. The human TSH assay does not accurately measure thyroid stimulating hormone in dogs or cats. You have to use a species specific canine test to measure it. So, okay, we're going to measure the total T4, we're going to measure the important free fraction, and then we'll measure thyroid stimulating hormone. Well, that's great, but there's no thyroid antibodies being measured. So, you're not diagnosing the autoimmune form of Hashimoto's disease at all which is the one they're most worried about with reproduction, you know, breeding the animals. So it's essential for thyroid hormone diagnostics to do age and breed specific normal range. So we have to have the breed and the age, like I told you, all animals are not the same. So the reference land ranges are not based on that. So we have to have our own range, which is something that Hemopet does, by the way, worldwide. We are the only veterinary diagnostic lab that has 20 more, 25 years actually, of accumulated data on age and breed specific normals for, for thyroid disease. So we can more accurately diagnose an individual animal as having normal or abnormal thyroid function. Thyroid hounds are lower, we've talked about that already. And so treating them for thyroid hormone is wrong unless they really are low, and many sight hounds are low, but their ranges have to be age and breed specific. Now, the other thing we, we get mixed up in that veterinary medicine is in humans, people that take thyroid hormone are known not to give it with food. They're told to give it apart from meals. Many veterinary forms of thyroid hormone say you can put it in the food. That is incorrect. We've tried to look back uh, 20 years or so to find out how this mistake happened. And we think it's because people were worried that, that the owners would be putting their fingers in the mouth of the dog to get the pill down them and they might get bitten or hurt. So therefore, they said, much easier, just throw it in the food, don't worry about it, they'll eat it. Well, first of all, they don't always eat all the food. Secondly, they may leave the pill in the bottom of the dish. But much more importantly, this hormone binds to calcium and soy in foods. So any food that has calcium in it, like dairy products or bones, meat with bones in it, or any soy products, which obviously you eat in Taiwan, should not be given at the same time as thyroid hormone because it affects its ability to be absorbed. But you have to give it at least one hour, at least one hour before these foods or three hours after someone has eaten calcium or soy. So how do we do that practically when thyroid hormone in pets needs to be given twice a day? Not once a day, like in humans. We give it one hour before breakfast in the morning, typically, and we give it three hours after supper in the evening. Because when you come home from work, your animal is very hungry and you're not going to wait for another hour uh, if you give the pill first. So you feed them to keep them feeling happy. And then three hours later, when you're relaxing in the evening, you can give them their thyroid pill. Now, one of the things that happens because veterinarians may not keep all the different sizes of thyroid hormone in their pharmacy is that they send the pet owner to the human drug pharmacist to get the medicine. The problem is that human pharmacies have much lower doses of thyroid hormone than we use in dogs. Animal doses of thyroid hormone in hypothyroidism are 10 times higher than the human would take for the same disease. And remember, animals are taking it twice a day because the half-life is only 12 to 16 hours. So in order to get a steady state of thyroid hormone throughout the day, you have to give it twice a day. In people, the half-life is like five days. It's much slower humans 
age more slowly. So therefore it's given once a day. So remember that humans take one tenth of the animal dose of thyroid hormone. Now let's say that your veterinarian diagnosed your pet as being hypothyroid and you were not convinced that that was correct, mainly because maybe because they only tested a total T4. So you want to have a proper complete testing done. We want to stop the treatment. Now, if the animal was behaviorally aggressive and biting you and other people and starting the thyroid hormone, regardless of whether the tests are right or not, stop the behavior, then please don't stop the treatment. Because obviously, uh, the dose may need to be changed, but the animal needs it. If you stop the thyroid hormone drug for any other reason, you have to wait six weeks or longer before you retest it. Because it takes six weeks for the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus gland in the head to re-regulate the production of thyroid stimulating hormone and the thyroid hormone. So if you're stopping it, you have to wait six weeks. If you test it before that, it will be low because the body's not re-equilibrated itself to make the thyroid hormone under its normal regulatory control. So some pet owners, holistically minded people that are interested in homeopathy and natural products rather than drugs, and I myself am a holistic um, veterinarian, and we've been vegetarians for 50 years, so we are naturalists ourselves, and we don't take any drugs unless we absolutely have to. So some people want to use thyroid support supplements or a hormone called thytrophin. However, these can help thyroid function, but they cannot correct true hypothyroidism or the autoimmune destructive form of, of thyroid disease because, as I told you, the thyroid gland can't regenerate. So you're supporting the thyroid gland that's only partially active. That doesn't help. So we always give the hormone in dogs twice daily. We're not talking about cats now. We're talking about dogs. Always give it apart from meals one hour before or three hours after eating. Give it without foods containing calcium or soy. I'm repeating now what I've just told you for emphasis because it's so important. Okay, so let's look at some of the things we see when an animal is hypothyroid. The animal can be overweight, as I mentioned before. It can be lethargic. It doesn't have normal energy. It's really blah. It can hate the cold and it wants to hide, as this dog is, under a blanket. Especially in the Orient, you wouldn't expect that to happen. And if you look at this little beagle hiding under the blanket to keep warm, she's got anxiety in her eyes. See, she's anxious looking. She looks frightened. She's definitely anxious and she's cold. Now, she may be aggressive if you suddenly try to take off the blanket and pick her up because she doesn't want to be pestered with or, or, or it, she wants to just hide, basically. So here we have, look at the eyes. This is really important. If you look at this hypothyroid malamute, the eyes look tragic and sad and anxious. A little bit of just not doing right. So the majority of dogs with thyroid disease are hypo or have low thyroid hormone, whereas most older cats are hyper and have high thyroid hormone. Now look at this cat. This cat is saying, okay, look at me. I'm gonna claw you or bite you if you come near me. So you see the eyes, look at that. So we have hypothyroidism and we have hypothyroidism. So just to reiterate again, so we never forget, most older cats are hyperthyroid, overactive. Most dogs, however, are hypothyroid, underactive. And what are people? They can be either. People can be hyper or hypo. Both conditions occur commonly in people. In the Orient, it's mostly Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is hypothyroidism, but you also have Graves' disease, which is hyperthyroid, and you can feel um, a small mass in the center of your neck 
in, in front of your esophagus, when you have um, a potential for hyperthyroidism in people. So here's feline hyperthyroid, and look at this cat staring, see? The cat is staring at you, look at the eyes. And what does this cat show us? Insatiable hunger, always hungry, ravenous appetite, losing weight because the thyroid is working too hard metabolically, howling, crying all the time, pacing left and right, drinking way too much water, pacing constantly, pain in the neck. This poor cat has become an impossible house pet. You need to avoid foods high in iodine for these animals, especially fish, to help prevent hyperthyroidism. And then we give them medication to suppress the thyroid gland. Or if we can feel a thyroid tumor in the neck, we actually can remove it surgically. Or we can treat the cat with radioactive iodine-131 uh, to or technetium, another radioactive um, product, to uh, destroy the thyroid gland. And we do that in people too. So in cats, hyperthyroidism has, again, as I said, dramatic hunger, insatiable hunger, dramatic weight loss, howling, constant pacing, staring of the eyes. So we want to avoid foods that are high in iodine, like many fish. And of course, remember, cats love fish, so we have to be careful there. So let's now turn. I didn't know how many of you people also had cats. That's why I decided to talk about them, too. Why not, right? If we're going to test for canine thyroid dysfunction properly, you need the whole thyroid antibody profile, at least initially, so you know what you're dealing with. If you start with just a T4 and that's not enough, and then you have to do a free T4, and then you do a TSH, and then you do the antibodies, you're spending way too much money while your dog is suffering. So you need to do the whole thing up front, even though it's going to be more expensive, because in the long run, your animal will benefit, and so with your pocketbook, you won't spend as much money. Now, in the dog, we need the canine version of thyroid-stimulating hormone. However, it's a poor test. We even call it a crappy test. Excuse my English. It's poorly predictive. It only accurately measures hypothyroidism in dogs 70% of the time. In humans, the equivalent thyroid stimulating hormone assay for people is 95% accurate. So when we have a diagnostic test that gives you the wrong answer 30% of the time, it's not useful and we really should not rely on it. And why is that? Why is the dog different from people? Because the dog has another regulatory way of managing thyroid hormone through growth hormone in the head. So growth hormone regulates thyroid production in the dog about 30% of the time, and the rest of it comes from TSH. Whereas in humans, growth hormone has a minimum effect, less than 5% of controlling um, human thyroid function. Now, the basic thyroid levels that you're going to measure are affected up to 25%. In other words, a quarter of the levels you're measuring can be changed by steroids, Low doses of prednisone, now we're talking about a significant doses of corticosteroids. Femobarbital as an anticonvulsant for epilepsy. Sulfonamide antibiotics that are commonly used uh, to treat infections in today, although I must tell you, frankly, we don't want to use potentiated sulfonamide antibiotics like trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole or um, trimethoprim sulfides of any kind in animals these days because they suppress the thyroid. Also, there's a anticonvulsant sulfonamide called zonisamide that also has all those things. Sulfonamides cause rheumatoid arthritis-like symptoms. They can cause necrosis of the liver. They can cause behavioral problems. And to me, as a veterinary hematologist, I'm most concerned about the fact that they can destroy red blood cells and platelets. And since you have autoimmune hemolytic anemia, 
or autoimmune thrombocytopenia when the platelets are too low from using sulfonamide. So obviously we don't want to give them, never mind the fact that they can affect the thyroid. And then if you feed too much iodine, that's also a problem. Most commercial pet foods now made throughout the world have a lot of iodine put in them. And they were put in them over the last 15 years or so because so much hypothyroidism was being diagnosed that the pet food industry thought, hmm, we can probably prevent some of that by adding more iodine to our foods. And so they added more iodine than animals really need. And then we came along as pet owners and veterinarians and we said, gee, just to make sure your animal has enough iodine for uh, keeping the thyroid normal, why don't we add seaweed like kelp as a supplement? And so many of us use supplements now in addition to a basic commercial pet food that contain iodine in the form of seaweed. Please be very careful. If you're feeding a commercial pet food today with plenty of iodine, whether it's a dog or a cat, please do not feed kelp regularly. Maybe once a week would be okay. If on the other hand, you make your own pet food or you're feeding a raw pet food that does not contain iodine supplement, you can feed kelp products three times a week even without a problem and you need enough iodine, but not too little or too much. Basal levels, basic levels of thyroid hormone are lowered by estrogen and they're raised by progesterone. So when intact non-spayed females are just about to come into heat, say 30 days before their estrus cycle, or you're actually in estrus, their basal thyroid levels will be lower than they are otherwise. So that's not the time to get an accurate diagnosis for genetic screening, or if you have a healthy pet trying to figure out what's going on, or even if you have an ill pet during an estrus cycle, the late basal levels of thyroid hormones will be changed. Now, if the animal is pregnant, or in the first 60 days after a heat cycle, when you can get pyometra or an infected uterus, the basal thyroid levels are often higher than they are otherwise. So again, sex hormonal changes affect thyroid function. Now finally, sorry, rabies vaccine, if it's used 45 days before the testing is done, can increase the level of thyroid autoantibody, but not very high. So unfortunately, some people who don't want to believe they're the Irish setter burying his head in the sand trying to dig down to Taiwan, um, People don't like the answer when their dog has an elevated thyroid autoantibody because it means they shouldn't breed the dog. And so they say, oh, well, the animal had a rabies vaccine 90 days beforehand, so that had to be the reason. So obviously that's not the case. It can be a slight increase, but only within 45 days of the vaccine. So what do you do? You wait until after 45 days and you retest it.